Rich, would you like to uh, sure. tee up how we've arrived at our format shift for this evening and what we are going to be attempting to achieve? Happily, happily. Well, first of all, we decided we would be in a, a much more free form uh, approach to this. And as it turns out, I got to be in my bonnet after speaking with a number of companies that were dealing with um, a byproduct of the COVID-19 problem. And that is, I was told that by a long, by a really great margin, the electronic health record system, the EMR systems, uh, basically fell over during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that the great majority of test results and information about patients, including their agreements to opt in or not opt in for different kinds of things, all on paper and pencil, and that the consolidation of information about the COVID-19 diagnostic tests in particular in New York City were taking an enormous amount of time to be processed, to be gathered up, and that in point of fact, we're kind of back in Stone Age when it comes to dealing with the test results, the rather simplistic test results, by the way, that are coming out of all of this testing. And it occurred to me after a conversation with a company that's in the laboratory instrument management software business, that what the country needs is kind of the equivalent of the old emergency broadcast system. Now, granted, it's not a perfect analogy, but what it basically did for those of you who never had to deal with it is put a black box in every television station, little radio station, large radio station, such that if there was an emergency, a national emergency, all of a sudden, all of the radio and television would switch to a predetermined set of frequencies and program. It could be used for the president to address the country, specialized aspects of Congress, state government when there was a regional emergency. It was a, it was a fairly simple-minded and very reliable, by the way, mechanism for getting the word out. What I posited to a bunch of my friends sitting here on this uh, August stage that looks like the Hollywood Squares, the same idea that is a national electronic data system or data service. And that if anything has been, you know, both a blessing and a curse, it's been the net. It's been our ability to deal with an amazing amount of, of different issues. And quite frankly, that's held up very well. It's done a great job with our data communication and most of the issues regarding work from home. But this particular issue is just stuck in my craw. Why don't we have something which is a national electronic data service or data system? When something it, gets on Rich Miller's mind. It stays there until, you know, it's the itch that has to be scratched. I put a LinkedIn message out and I got some interesting pushback and some reaction. And I continue to think that it's a very, very important aspect of what we have to do as an industry. And interestingly enough, it's something under which or over which this community actually does have some control and has some, some influence. So um, that's, that's my starting position here. Now, since putting that out, one of the things I've come to understand is where infrastructure in this country 
gets built and on whose dollar. And what's interesting is that the federal government is responsible for probably about 6% of all of the critical infrastructure in this country in terms of monies and ownership. Most of it comes from states and what's, and second, fairly close tie is from um, private corporation. So I guess my, my point here is what would have to be done and what should we be thinking about with respect to a national electronic data or emergency data service? And where does it fit in the hierarchy of needs? So I'll open that up. And I know Mike came back at me pretty strong about, you know, interesting, nice idea, but no, there are some other things I want to see get done first. So did he say I'll, bless your heart when he did that? Because I'm just I'm just asking. That was that would have been what he would have said had we been in polite company. We weren't. So you know. <laughs> I did not preface it with some uh, faux uh, leaning out. But, no, but just, Rich, to be serious, like I think I I like the idea, but what the nation and the world needs first is foundational identity. If you can't map data to a given set of people, whether it's EHR challenges or otherwise, or uh, the PPP distribution of funds, you need a proper identity system. And the various state driver's license are not IDs. Social security numbers certainly aren't, uh, which has then just been more bastardized by Adhar in India. I'd say globally, only Estonia has done this properly. And, and granted, there are 1.3 million people in total. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier. But like, this is the, the uh, people don't think about this. Or if they do, they're very silent, uh, other than me and, and my coworkers. <laughs> but that, that's the first issue to address. Uh, and you need identity to be the foundation and then build upon it. Uh, and then data comes and all of the other tracking and distribution goodness you would have no disagreement here because if in fact any of this is to work and be specific to individuals um, as well as being protected in an appropriate fashion, the identity framework has to be put in place. Right, but that makes my that's head explode. Because company, it's, I mean, right, the path we're going down is that's gonna be Facebook and Google and Apple and I, don't trust them. But, well, they haven't proven that they can't reduce or prevent civil attacks, meaning I can clone Rob Hirschfeld and impersonate. I mean, you can. I mean, I yeah. have, in fact, you know. I, I mean, the two things are, <laughs> how do you prove humanness and uniqueness? Yeah. And, and you do that through multi-factor biometric enrollment and monitoring. Facebook See, if we're going to go down to identity. identity and access management, Mike, I'm, I'm all over that one too. So but before we go down that rabbit hole, uh, just as an FYI. No, I don't want to take over the agenda for my no, personal but that, crusade. Yes, it's all I, I want that one. But it, it, <laughs> I want that one. It's, it's, actually, it's actually a very good point to be made. And that's saying these things are built on layers of, and they have their own foundations. An identity management system, a national identity management system of some sort, that does the right things with regard to safeguarding the information and, and you know, it's privacy, pre privacy preservation, but is effective enough to be used in a situation like what we have here is a precondition for this national emergency data service. That's fine. And I'm, I, I like the idea of a, of a goal and then kind of say, all right, what would we need in order to put it in place? And that's a, that's a real beauty. And right the challenge there. is, it, in order to be successful and truly private, it needs to be decentralized and put the identity power in the individual's hands, not in centralized government-run databases or Equifax or another credit bureau that has not been good stewards of privacy and protection. I knew we were going to get to blockchain solves everything. <laughs> I, was over. Did not mention blockchain. <laughs>
By the way, well, I encourage. We've seen how any, bad this goes with Equifax. I, I, by the way, anyone should should feel free to chime in, not just you know the the. the not just me. I, I will shut up now. I, I, I just think, those who are used to arguing. <laughs> Go ahead, I, I think just I think decentralized is the trigger word now. Anyway, doesn't you don't have to say blockchain anymore. Yeah. Uh, 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 this is an interesting um, uh, point of view on it because I. Um, we're, I know some of you guys know me and some of you don't, but uh, effectively what we do at GreenSpark is, is, is building data infrastructure around power plants, right? And we come from the world of power plants. So this whole idea of screwed up centralized systems for infrastructure, if you ever want to know how to do it the wrong way, take a look at how you get your critical electricity uh, on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of having... Uh, and I, I've had this discussion about like, hey, what if I just controlled my data, right? Why can't I, why do I get to give any money to Facebook or, or if Facebook is making a crap ton of money. How come I can't make a little large bag of money out of the, uh, I, I give them the rest for whatever service they think they provide. Um, what's that passport, call it whatever you want look like. Cause that's the thing that, 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 um, opens up the rest of your, uh, you know, I need a, a passport as a thing, a concept to do anything else, to get credit, to open a bank account, like in the world of what a passport, your actual physical passport does. What's that, how does that look? How do I keep that data secure and accessible and valuable, which is the thing that makes it valuable and be owned and controlled by me? or I could delegate it to an agent, but only con controlled by me. In the world of electricity, we've tried to do that with a meter at your house. Uh, and even then, the people who truly control that meter and the things you can do with it in terms of like, adjust your electricity consumption, you don't really have any insight into, and the guys who do control that meter don't care about making it any more efficient because that's not really their business model. Their business model is to ostensibly charge you uh, a black box for electricity and then invest in infrastructure. So um, for those of us who live in the Bay Area, you know how well that works out. But, uh, <laughs> but that idea of, uh, uh, of how you keep that separate and physically distributed is something for us that we're trying to sort out like well, and it... i think i think also there's some uh, we've been talking about the technology issues behind it but there's also the cultural issues of there's there's a, a segment of this society that says not letting the government in my life <laughs> you know not yes. not even Bless their heart but they're not coming in Right. And I, you know, I'm not even wearing a freaking mask. So if you think I'm going to do some kind of, you know, uh, national identity database, right. you're right. And that's a cultural thing. That's, I mean, you can make it as, as secure and protected and isolated as possible, and it's still going to get pushback. Or you might say it's well, a political this... reality with which we have to contend. Like you could like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could not like it. You can have your opinion. Uh, it sort of doesn't matter. Right, it is a political reality of the United States. I, the thing that's weird, though, is that means that we're going to end up having corporations do it, and that seems even scarier to me than the government. It is. Scary. I mean, maybe it's just me, but no, it is. It is scary. I mean, you know, it's it's been posited um, uh, by a number of people, not just uh, some of us on this call. Rob, I think you and I might have even had this uh, talk um, a year ago or more that we run the risk of having the nation of Amazon, the nation of Facebook at some point. Um, and I don't mean like Raider nation. I mean like actual nation of Amazon. And um, uh, to me, what we're talking about as far as a national database or an international database distributed or otherwise for ID is that um, like any good idea from a, from a concept, not just from a concept, but from a motivation standpoint, um, there is always somebody willing to corrupt it under the right circumstances. 
And um, I'm frankly, you know, terrified that this looks like the beginning of every bad science fiction movie or novel I've ever read or watched um, uh, as the beginning of the end of uh, normal everyday society. So uh, I, you know, I looked at, at, at thought about um, what Rich posted. And while I agree that what Mike suggests would help solve for it, I looked at it more from the perspective of an alert mechanism for general public benefit rather than an alert mechanism for validation of individual humans. And so it'd be more about validating entities and quality of content and security of content rather than whether or not Trevor or Mark sent it or it was specifically about them and that, 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 and that they are guaranteeing that it's about them. And, and you know, the, the kind of the simplistic way I was looking at that is that today, in almost every medical situation, even when you go to a hospital, the, the, you know, while, while some of the folks that are doing VR, et cetera, are talking about being able to tap into a database and, and AI tools that help you while you're doing surgery, the fact is, is that every single person who goes into a hospital today gets only the advice that their doctor happens to think applies to them. And that's, a, that's already a huge failing based on available technology. Now, if you morph that out one step further, 10 steps further, and you think about a new virus coming in, or even a virus introduced by someone with, with bad intent, the ability for hospitals to literally instantaneously know that they're seeing people come in with the exact same symptoms and being able to report that, share that, and, and immediately begin collecting validated data on how it's being treated, how it's responding, what populations are affected, how fast does it react, to me, that's where the value of that kind of system really comes in. So you're focused there predominantly on the distribution of information or notification. It's basically timeliness is the, is the issue, not necessarily identity, Mark. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And that's probably as close an analog to what I was talking about with the emergency broadcast system as anything, where I was finding myself just shaking my head in disbelief was the fact that in metropolitan areas, in hospitals, with arguably some of the best equipment available, not enough of it sometimes, but certainly among the best equipment, and these were these were hospitals these were medical centers that basically had to resort to you know you know 14th and 15th century uh, technologies in order to keep track of what was being recorded off of these tests and collected and collated in nothing other than you know stacks of paper, probably the closest they came to anything that was in close to technology was they faxed it around to various people. So here we've got a situation where um, we, are, we are letting ourselves in for uh, a world of hurt the next time this happens. To some degree, and we're not out of the woods yet, we're lucky that we had enough of a, of a, we had enough other kinds of means to kind of suppress this and keep it under control, reduce, you know, flatten the curve and spread things out that we weren't completely overrunning some of the medical establishments in this country. We came damn close. But here's something that just strikes me as, as unacceptable on its face, and that is that we really do not have a, a, an agile, reasonably simple means of the return path, the other direction from what you were just discussing, Mark, which is how do I get in a reasonable form, possibly with a reduction in the privacy that's, that's, um, that's granted to it, information that can be consolidated, can be used, and can be depended upon for the most part in terms of its 
capture its transmission and its consolidation in a situation like, you know, COVID-19, in an emergency situation with a you know, severe weather event, something else doesn't exist. Actually, um, we were talking about the, the whole notion of uh, uh, electric power and um, Trevor, you were talking about the electric grid. What in fact happens between what effectively are separate and somewhat independently operating grids or, or electric distribution systems, how do they in fact uh, communicate with one another, much less from, from the outskirts? I happen to know from the old days the way it used to be, and my guess is it hadn't changed much. Uh, I, I think I had a professor once tell me uh, there's something between burnt toast and death that's very, uh, so that's basically what it, it can literally run from. I, I, let me put it this way. Anybody here who's been on this on this call who's been around long enough to remember the blackout in 2003 in the Northeast? Yep. Um, uh, which put, I can't remember how many, 100 million people in the dark from Southern Ontario right down to Virginia, I think, and over to Ohio. Um, <laughs> that I was... I really think that no one on this call is 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 old enough to remember uh, that, uh, by uh, the way. Uh, I, I for those of you who are too young, I'll go into the history. Uh, right uh, uh, <laughs> Great, I greatly appreciate that, and we'll accept it. I'm glad that I could humor everyone. But it, um, the, uh, the grid that existed then, uh, it still exists now, um, if, for those of you who don't know what happened, it was a disruption, and I believe in a line in Ohio that had a cascading effect. The only thing different uh, operation, or the only thing different um, physically uh, is we have better committees and better communication structures. So, uh, Rich, there can be um, within a system operator, so America's power grid is actually a bunch of small grids. There's actually three physically separate grids, either side right. of the Rockies and of course, Texas. Uh, and then within the, like Texas is literally a, so Texas That's is the equivalent of like, remember those days when you like, if you crossed in Eastern Europe, they had to like put you on a different train cause like, so they couldn't invade by train and, and they had like a separate bogey wheels or something for like, yep. that's that's how Texas works. Uh, and, and then you have within that, there's like regional operators. Well, within the regional operators sort of New England and New York, um, they have good systems of doing it, uh, relatively speaking, of, of communication and telling you what uh, system controls exist. But as soon as you go and you find the rift between them, so New York and New England into New York into what we call PJM into MISO, um, it starts to break down. And then it certainly breaks down. Um, uh, so what you, you try to do is wall off the damage to um, a, a smaller subsector, which typically means one utility's area of control. Hmm. Um, and again, for those of us who live in the Bay Area, we're familiar with what our incumbent utility has done. What pg e has done in terms of not done its, its investment in infrastructure, even though that's what your power bill pays for. Uh, that is everywhere. That's, I mean, PG&E has some unique challenges in terms of wildfires in a huge territory, but the, um, that issue is everywhere in North America. Um, if you, I think um, uh, there was an attack on a substation in pg &E's territory that was deemed to look like a planned attack. Somebody went in, it's the usual kind of damage that happens to Electrical infrastructure is Yahoo's shooting at stuff and getting drunk and whatever. Um, this was a planned attack, so much so that the FBI got involved, and which got a Senate subcommittee involved. And they realized that if I took out, there's three manufacturing facilities for substation equipment in the world. Um, none of them, I think, are in the United States. One is in Germany, the other two are Chinese. If you took out one of those, guess where? Uh, and if you took out 11 substations in the United States and understand that there are 
thousands of substations in the United States. 11 critical substations, you could black out the United States for six months. That's what the Senate subcommittee heard, and they only got upset about it that it got leaked out to the public. So that kind of infrastructure, like we're, we're at a issue of how do I change that centralized infrastructure? Uh, it, the, the distributed infrastructure exists. There are tens of thousands of substations. How do I leverage are, that true grid? And they that, are independently managed or at least they, some degree, some degree autonomously managed? The, there's a lot of issues where there is, some of them are remotely handleable. Like if you're the California system operator, you can either you or the transmission operator, which in that case would be the investor owned utility. Um, you would have, um, you can either, somebody at the system operator can tweak the, uh, uh, they, they can either turn a knob themselves or they can call someone who can turn the knob directly. There are some that are, for a host of reasons, are not touchable, the age of the equipment. Well, um, and so that idea of being able to have the remote control is tough. In, in, so they're not generally critical, but um, all the mission critical ones you can control centrally. Is there, is there any system of which we're aware that you think comes close to the kind of malleability and, and, you know, capability of adapting to, you know, speedily to a shock or, or a, an unexpected event. I mean, supposedly. So I'll, while we wait for Rich to come back, yeah. I'll, I'll say something probably controversial. Like, I personally would trust Amazon nation over our current leadership nation. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. With respect to that's, running that's infrastructure right. properly. Uh, I don't think that's <laughs> controversial right now. Um, yeah, yeah, Mike, yeah. I think that's. <laughs> yeah. At any other point in history, that might have been controversial. <laughs> yeah. but right now, yeah. Too easy. Yeah. Too uh, easy. I've got cheese in my fridge. I trust more to run national infrastructure right now than than uh, than, yeah. than I work over there. But I, have, I actually have a question question about that because yeah. there's a part of me that thinks that we actually should be able to trust our institutions to run national infrastructure, but we don't trust them to change very quickly. And that the oh. the problem that we're having is that we have this anticipated pace of change desire that's interfering with us actually building really robust, transparent infrastructure we could rely on because we feel like they're just going to take too long. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, that pace of change may well be um, a feature and yeah. not a bug. Well, well, it's a feature until it breaks our democracy. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I agree to some degree. I mean, it, it really depends on which infrastructure we're talking about. But like, I mean, if you, take, if you want to pick on somebody um, uh, you could pick on uh, PG&E as a great example. PG&E, and, and maybe, maybe Trevor could shine some light on this, but PG&E would go in to the, to the PUC and say, we need X much money from the state because we're going to be replacing 10,000 uh, power poles this year or over the next three years or whatever it is. Well, the problem is there's nobody there checking on what they actually do with that money and whether they actually replace 10,000 poles. Yes. So they replace 1,000 and they take the money and use it to give bonuses to the executive team, among other stuff, or just to cover for other failures. And right. then two or three years later, they ask for money for 10,000 power poles again. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, in, in pg es case, they actually went the step further of actually falsifying, having put in the poles up and then, and then getting caught for that. So, uh, but part of that, and, and this is when I talk about this as infrastructure, and again, we're, we're trying to, use cheap power that's available now to build data infrastructure, right? Um, you have a, 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 a necessary infrastructure backbone that's there and we want to leverage it. The, but the challenge is, just as Mark pointed out, and it, this may, Rob, to your point about like, do I trust Amazon versus a government agency to run this kind of thing? Um, certainly for a utility, um, where you have a guaranteed monopoly um, that I go to a PUC and generally, you know, the CPUC, it's the same in every state and province. It's a small board of people. They're either elected directly or appointed by politicians. 
generally you have a handful of big utilities who look at those guys and say, hey, one of you guys is going to win the lottery be, and be VP of regulatory affairs and get paid three times as much when you get done. Um, so when we're talking about our next rate case, can we just all keep that in mind? And, and so the idea that it, it, it running into the publicly, the public, you know, the, the equities domain of having those as publicly traded companies in the day when they paid big dividends and were a bond replacement because they had a regulated monopoly, I can look at them as an investor and say, they're risk, they're riskless because everybody needs electricity, right? That, that's the argument. Um, what happens when a pg &E happens, right? And you're stuck with that kind of liability. And is that really the best way to run critical infrastructure? Because as we're seeing, the argument becomes, okay, if it's a zero interest rate environment, um, I only attract Wall Street's attention by paying a bigger dividend year after year. That's, are you either gonna jack up electricity rates? When I say I wanna jack up electricity rates by 50% to pay for all that broken infrastructure, the CPUC says like, whoa, hey, even though I got this job waiting for me at the end, I still got a governor in Sacramento who says like, you're gonna put up electricity rates by how much again? I wanna get reelected. So uh, then they say, well, you, we'll put them up 20%. How's that? It's like, well, okay, well, all the polls I said I was gonna replace, um, they aren't gonna get replaced. I, this, is, this has been a consistent problem in the way we have this interaction with with infrastructure, public infrastructure, right? Because I, I would make the same argument about gas tax, right? right? We haven't had a, right. you know, we can't fund infrastructure improvements because we're not willing to increase gas tax and not even do something simple like when gas goes down, you raise the gas tax at that time so that people right. don't feel it as much. Um, yeah, I, this is, this to me is a fundamental governing problem where we're just watching the, the way we govern critical infrastructure fail, which to me now is full circle to where Rich, where Rich was starting, right? I, I, here's my problem, right? I don't, I don't think that companies are very good about making the large systemic investments that we're talking about creating a you know, sustainable infrastructure, long-term sustainable infrastructure that a community can build on top of. Right, that's what the highway, the high, the national highway system created so much benefit, but it took a long time. It was a massive investment. You had to design, you had to play by the rules, right? And then we, we got it and then we took it for granted and we haven't been improving it or extending it or making it, you know, increasing the public good. I, in Texas here, they can't agree on paying for roads at all and they just build tow homes everywhere because it's right. cheaper. Um, right. And so, so I, you know, I scratch my head about this stuff because it feels like we've, we've created these, these weird, we, these, these unbalanced incentives um, and we, we just keep doing it. Um, so I, yeah, I, 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 I understand people's concerns about turning it over to public, uh, uh, private, public company versus a, or a private company, but I don't see, you know, Amazon, you know, the, you know, the, the history of all the monopolies we've dealt with Am, you know, Amazon, you know, the story for Amazon isn't going to end well. Um, no. It's not going to end well for us. Probably yeah. not. I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. think so either. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so so maybe a bigger question for us all, a bigger, um, wider, not necessarily bigger as in deeper in thought, um, is, you know, that uh, the potentially the fundamental truth um, <laughs> that needs to happen is that we need to fix how government operates and we can't have it be continue to be corrupt because then it doesn't matter what you throw into the soup. Um, you can't, you can't make it straight because it bends within an hour um, because of the corruption that's built into the system, whether it's lobbyists or how super PACs are formed or pick any number of incentives that make government do the things that they do and allow corporations to get away with the things they get away with. Um, so knowing that that's all true and knowing that we probably can't solve for that on the call right now, um, you know, if, 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 if we were uh, uh, an advisory body to the healthcare system in North America or to the emergency response system, whether it was zombies, pandemic, or, um, uh, you know, I'm being joking, obviously, but, uh, or, you know, some other issue that was occurring in, in greater civilization, um, 
you know, what, what could we do that could have a positive impact and speed the time to value for, for good information and potentially provide us better health care at the same time? Because, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as I mentioned when we talked a couple of weeks ago in prep for this call, I was doing a little bit of just work in the community, and I found that the purchasing uh, environment within uh, hospitals is as anti antiquated as it gets, requiring all kinds of physical signatures and sometimes taking two, three, four weeks to get approved. Um, the only way they can buy is if they have uh, a, you know, 30 day um, uh, post receipt uh, payment, um, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that, that's true in so many other parts of the healthcare system that we're, we're missing out on protecting us before the problem occurs in so many areas um, that, you know, this kind of system could help be a part of that uh, preventive medicine rather than reactive medicine like everything we do now. No takers? I think everybody just nodded their heads and went home. It was smiles and, and head nodding. Um, so just as a time check, it's uh, 4.15 uh, in, the, in the West. Uh, and I don't know um, if folks have a hard stop or if there's a, a pivot that we want to take. Um, obviously, there was, in mid-break, mid we can't get Rich Miller back in. We tried, but um, apparently because he was removed since this. Um, I'm, working, was I'm working on it. The, uh, that person was like trying to take over his thing i don't know it. his yeah. evil I'm twin ruined it for him his evil twin um any other uh directions that we want to go to uh while we're here i mean obviously we're you know talking about different you know it infrastructure and systems we've talked about privacy and compliance we've talked about data and where it resides and my favorite topic as of late is both you know decentralizing the data which we don't have to get back into again um any any particular area amy are you cool if i pick on you i mean uh, lots of things in this area, and I, I just knowing you, you got to have a POV. So you, you want to share it? <laughs> As it happens, I do. Um, yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Amy Anderson, and I've known Amy, Amy H. since, gosh, eight. 2014. Yeah. Okay. 2014. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was at the time working for a smaller uh, software company that was partnered with IBM and we were doing a lot of cloud stuff. Um, as of last winter and, and the last two years, I was focused at a different software company completely on application modernization for legacy systems. And as of this winter, I came back to IBM where I originally started and I'm on a team and we are doing nothing but mainframe and AS400 modernization. So when you talk about, um, you know, well, Rich was talking about like, what's with these systems? They're so old. And um, that, that's all I deal with every day. And, um, you know, my boss was on the phone with state of New Jersey every day for uh, many days after the governor of New Jersey had said, gosh, if only we had more COBOL programmers, everything would be fine. Um, yeah. Which yeah. <laughs> turned out actually COBOL wasn't the problem and the mainframe wasn't the problem. It was all the systems connecting into it. It was the UIs that were crumbling. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot behind all of that stuff. But speaking of uh, not funding infrastructure and kicking the can down the road, every single one of these state, you know, uh, uh, agencies that are providing, you know, funding of any kind to citizens and businesses, nobody wants to pay to upgrade IT infrastructure in these small state and local governments. And it is biting the whole country in the ass when it comes to this pandemic. And, you know, it, 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 it at some point we have to say this stuff is worth spending money on and no one ever and you know then there's the whole you know high percentage of the population that doesn't understand why it matters it's like it's just a computer just fix it 
and you know and then there's a whole population of people that are like never want to spend another dime in government ever again it's like well that's not realistic either so you know how do you how do you move everybody forward without breaking things so i mean we're staring down another <laughs> another dangled infrastructure week um, I don't know what went wrong in, in this current administration. Uh, it's the 12th or 13th or something. I don't, I don't know how many infrastructure so we should bingo through. card with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to reach back <laughs> into the bar here and grab something to drink every time I hear infrastructure week. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, um, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, it happens. Um, and uh, it's not that we can't spend a trillion dollars in infrastructure. Um, does anybody know what the price tag of such a demand would be? Because I look at it for what we do and talking to sort of, you know, rural power cooperatives that also want to find new sources of revenue. And they look at, you know, well, can we help build out fiber? Cause we've got the way in and nobody, and Google's not going to come here. Right. Um, so, uh, or whoever is not going to come here, we're going to have to do it. Um, so if you have any idea, like how you would, even if I said, here's an unlimited amount of money, uh, which we're printing as we speak, um, you know, what, how would I do it? Like, do you have any, any, like, how do you start? Well, we already know there's a lot of ways to do it badly. Uh, <laughs> yes. you, the, the, and, and it, you know, people lose their, their minds over, um, you know, some government agency that spent $20 million on a software <laughs> upgrade that failed. Right. And they'll say, no, uh, the government, you know, they can't do anything right. I can tell you about a private business that spent a billion dollars on a software upgrade before they went back to what they had because the new thing didn't, was never going to work. One billion dollars. Wow. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we're starting to see is, you know, first of all, not just starting to see, but we already know these kind of big bang modernization projects are, are they almost never work. So how do you take it in little bites? Okay. And, and how do you, um, and, and is it the right thing, first of all, to get rid of all your cobalt? Um, that's the first question. You know, yes, it would be lovely, but you know, the damn thing runs, it never crashes. You know, it can, it can go from, you know, a million unemployment claims a month to a hundred billion unemployment claims and it doesn't even hiccup because it's a mainframe. You know, do you really wanna, you know, get rid of all of that? Do you wanna just do it in pieces? Um, you, you know, we talked about shovel ready projects in 2009 when we did this, whether those were real or not, but we never ever, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm from the energy business. So there's lots of those people, oh, let's build windmills. Uh, well, I'm not against that obviously, but do we have, I think that's a shovel. I think fixing the unemployment um, system for Florida or, or insert state name here, I don't want to pick on anyone. Um, is a shovel ready on, project. Trevor, pick on somebody. <laughs> I, that was a particularly egregious example. Uh, and in Jersey, I guess too, but, uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Florida actually spent money on it to try and fix it the first time around or, or yeah. unfix it, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but, and, and Trevor, I will say those are different problems than what you actually, the question you actually posed, which is what about these little rural cooperatives? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they don't have even a million users sometimes. I mean, I, right. you know, I have, uh, my husband and I have a cabin in a very remote part of Northern Minnesota and these are low budget operations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yes. They're not going to get more money anytime soon. So. Right. That's and, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, We've been on some Twitter threads lately. Um, at least I know Mark and Mike and and I've been. Uh, and the boys participated too. That was crazy. 
Uh, but but a lot of it's like, oh, we'll just dump it all, go to the cloud. And I, I do think one of the diseases that we have in the tech industry is this willingness to dump infrastructure as, oh, just turn it off. Nobody will notice. And, you know, build the new thing on Kubernetes and it's all going to be great. Right? It's the shiny, shiny beacon without thinking through the amount of robustness and hardening that's gone into a lot of these pieces. I, I know I, I keep coming back to the same theme. But you know this this idea that we're just going to fix these you know human impacted systems, which is at all the systems overnight, is I think um, it, it actually gets in the way of fixing the systems, right? I mean that's the what right? we've always I mean, said, right, Rob? It's the tech is the tech's the easy part, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean it's, it's that's what well, we've that, always that, said. And, and, and sometimes it's like saying, all right, I'm going to build a system that's upgradable, you know, but I have to figure out how it's upgradable. I'm going to spend time retrofitting a, something to make sure it fits, right? It goes back to the, you know, um, the, the Roman chariot axles determining the size of, of the space shuttle. Um, because, the, you know, right, that those, these, these are linked systems going, and they're incredibly hard to change. And, and, I, I, it just it just strikes me that we're getting very impatient to change them. Um, I don't know how to fix that. It's it's, well, it's sort of this. We're getting impatient because you're seeing these other systems that can turn on a dime that are super mm. agile. So you're like, well, they can do it. Why can't I? And it's so, like, well, but, you have thirty years of technical debt. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so I it. But one of the funny things, so like. There, there was one of the things the pandemic has shown us is this idea that I'm going to get masks cheap out of China or part A from China because they can do it cheaper. And, you know, oh, I'm just going to ship it across the world as a way to, to you know, to save some, save some money and, and, and do that. All of a sudden, we're seeing the cost of just automatically going for the e efficient solution without really thinking through the, the longer term repercussions mm -hmm. um but that's i, I mean, mean i'm not but you're on a, I'm not sure you're on a big going. point but you're on a big mm -hmm. point that's that's relevant to you know all the things that we talk about right i mean some of this stuff changes so quickly so when we talk about you know i'm back to security space just for a minute yeah. right i mean stuff Please. we're looking at right now m might be irrelevant in 18 months and you know i know if i start talking like kyle's gonna be like yep 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 i mean when we start talking about like even monitoring and observability some of this stuff is changing so fast you can go ahead and start trying to retrofit certain things and it's not even going to be relevant you know for for, for a really long time um I, and I but see, i'm also you know, and i'm also not sure that if you switch to the 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 you know the, the observability du jour you'd actually be making a good investment. Well, that, part of, but then, I mean, you, know, then you can like start a, getting back into like the whole piece about the data, right? Because ultimately what we always want to come back to is kind of the, the data component of it. And I think that that's, you know, where a lot of us have spent a lot of time thinking about. So, so yeah, Rob, yeah. I think just because something can be observed doesn't mean it should be. Oh, so 100%. Like, like everything gets lumped into monitoring or observability or whatever the buzzword we want to call it. But like, why are you monitoring or observing that? Does it really matter? Well, right. and then what are you doing with it, right? We've talked about that and the whole notion of data hoarding. I mean, that's, a, that's another slippery slope that I don't want to like start us down now, you know, with <laughs> 8424, right? But, 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 but that's the thing we're talking about is, you know, none of this is e ever easy. Uh, right. you know. But what but what happens when we have a blockchain that doesn't have enough processors on the chain? Like this is specifically to you, right? What happens when a blockchain loses popularity so there aren't enough people to recompute the the chain? I mean, it's uh, what's well, it depends on the consensus algorithm first for the given chain and who is running that. So like specifically, we use proof of authority. Uh, the sealer nodes are run by a decentralized autonomous organization. So you distribute out that risk. There's always yeah. some, some level of risk that that happens, but yeah. if you distribute that enough um, and have the right incentives, you reduce that. But I mean, any given system has a, some point of failure. So, 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 
again, not to not to disrupt an, a, a, a great conversation. We've gone in a couple of different directions. We're, we're at 425, just to keep us all honest here, you know, probably, probably should try to wrap. But, and you guys know this as well as I do, right? It's super fun talking, you know, when we get in the hallway and we talk about stuff at, at conferences, you know, we have a great time kind of geeking out, you know, for those of you who did have done the Cloud Minds huddle, right? We always try to get to, okay, you know, then what? <laughs> What's the next step? How are we going to think about this? How do we get the right groups together to start thinking about, you know, what does a solution look like? What problem are we trying to solve? Um, you know, obviously, since we've kind of pivoted format on the, the Zoom speakeasy thing, you know, what what would kind of be the next way to kind of gather this and, you know, revisit this in the next couple of weeks when we come back back together again? So let me just kind of throw that out there. And I'm not sure there's an easy answer, by the way. Yeah, um, but let me throw that out there. Yeah, I'm not sure there's an easy answer either. I mean, I look at it and, and one of the problems that I face as a, as a long time IT person is see a problem, try to come up with an answer all in the same uh, a voice. And, and that's generally speaking, one, not possible and two, not the right approach. But uh, when I have one of these kinds of discussions, I mean, I love the discussion, but um, whether it's because there's an audience or potential audience, um, I feel like, oh, I'm supposed to wrap this up with an answer so that you can go home and have a better life. And, and maybe that's asking too much of all of us. So no, we, can be totally, we can be uncomfortable sitting with it, but, but yeah. maybe can we, can we use the last four minutes that we have to at least like try to identify a couple of next steps. And I, again, I also agree with you, Mark. There's no way we're wrapping this up in a neat little bow. And that's okay. Like, I think we're all, we're okay with it. We're amongst friends. Here. Um, but, but thoughts on that? I mean, um, you know, lot, lots, lots of different topics came up here. I mean, we kind of jumped around a lot, which was, which is both fun and uh, daunting at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe one thing I'll throw out, Amy. I mean, are there certain stakeholder communities that if we're going to think about this, that we ideally would fold into this discussion? I mean, maybe we're not going to get the solution, but did we, is there anything out of this that we like, you know, to move the needle forward, to move the ball forward, we'd really have to kind of interface with this group or this group or that group. I'm just kind of curious if anyone has any thoughts that start there. Well, I mean, I, I it's, it's ironic that I just got off a, an advisory board call that went almost two hours with one of the companies that I'm advising right now. And, and one of the things that I spent a lot of time talking to them about was the fact that they're, while they're doing really well, all things being equal, in a market where the consumer tends to move relatively slowly for them, um, the hardest thing that any of us can face is the education hurdle in trying to sell our product or service, right? Um, uh, I mean, and almost all of us, if not all of us, have probably faced that battle more than once. So I love what you just said, Tim, but you know, does it make sense for us to, do you, do we think we could elevate this and, and, and get the right kind of people to say, look, let's get a, a, a four or five of a senior advisors or people of um, power in the healthcare industry or in the power industry or whatever it is that we're targeting and, um, and make them listen to us as an advisory council, even if it's unsolicited. Um, is that a way to, is that even something we could pursue? Or would it make any difference? My experience in uh, either the people at the at the weakest end. So if we want to talk about um, like rural cooperatives, they want the most education advice. We'll call it whatever we'd like to call it. Like they need to understand what the world is really like. Um, it, uh, in specifically what we do on one side of the ledger in terms of electricity, because we've got this messed up marketplace for it. It's a fragmented world. So they tend to all want to say, hey, tell me how I made, you're going to tell me I got a different revenue stream? Okay, I'm, you've got my attention. Um, and and therefore, yeah. Yeah, right, it, it's, you know, it's a, I, I, I could fight against that and say, that's not really the way to build out this infrastructure, but uh, I mean, I, I got to lash myself to something. But in terms of um, uh, yeah, I, I really think that there is um, a, a, a world at the, at the, the far end, uh, you know, the, the more rural cooperative end user at that end world for this infrastructure that needs it because they see themselves as falling into a technology gap um, where they get further behind 
the big cities, you know, um, and, and, and I mean, I see it as a, a confluence of, of data connectivity and energy, uh, like as, as physical infrastructure. Um, I don't know what those little boxes together look like. I have a lot of those conversations about what that physical stuff looks like. Um, is it a magic box that looks like a shipping container that's got servers and an antenna and solar panels on it? I don't know if that's really worked that way, but that's what a lot of, and then who owns it? But then the issue is like, okay, who owns it? And how do I plug it into whatever grid it is, whether it's the wireless grid, whether it's, uh, whatever it is, right? It, 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 whether it's the power grid, whether it's um, the, the data grid, whether it is the connectivity grid. Um, I, I've honestly, like that's the toughest part is to get those, it's to get Verizon to not just be, um, think like a publicly traded company and that motivation, it's to get them to understand their partner infrastructure base. It's to not to convince PG&E and Verizon and Equinix to change their uh, way they do things. It's to get them to understand how the three of those pieces of infrastructure play together. And that's an edu that's one education curve. The other education curve is how do I make that work out in the world where they have sparse bits of that infrastructure to start with. Um, so that's what I see. Trevor, I gotta I gotta contact you separately because uh, all kinds of things up in um, my part of northern Minnesota that oh great yeah it's, into all of this yeah I, I, I'm a little bit familiar there as an energy trainer but uh, yeah it's just, it's <laughs> it's a bit of a wild world when you get um, you know uh, yeah. yeah would love to yeah okay cool yeah cool so with that I would say since uh. Laura, this has been a really very interesting and it was a, a nice small group um, with some entertaining interruptions. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I think we'll do as a next step is um, come back uh, with uh, the, the group of five, which we call kind of the, the founding organizers. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things we, we might do as a next step. And you know, maybe the next step again is coming back together as a small group, seeing if we can start to sort of outline if you will, um, you know, start start to come up with, you know, who are the different kind of representatives in the different, you know, ecosystem members we want to think to kind of bring into this conversation and sort of what might be the, the right way to kind of pull those folks into the engagement and build it up before we start trying to <laughs> boil the ocean, which we know is, is not easy. So um, Mark, Rob, Mike, I know we lost Rich, but does that kind of sound like a good you know, next step. And Trevor, thank you so much, obviously, for sharing that. I know uh, how to find you through, through some good friends here. So we, we know how to find you. <laughs> I, I didn't know if there was like a, like, yeah, how that was going to work. So I just figured out whatever. Here you go. This is how you reach me or find me. I just, uh, I just uh, stopped you on LinkedIn because you're the one person I didn't, I didn't know. Um, but the good news is we're, we're connected to like 20 of the same people. So I, I can oh, find okay. you. You're good. good. <laughs> I can find you. Um, so Rob, Mark, Mike, does that sound like a good next step? And Amy, uh, obviously, I'd like to keep you on the hook on these dialogues, too. Um, it's been sure. way too long since we've gotten to sit in the same room. But, you know, I, know. I think these kinds of conversations are really important to, to trying to figure out, you know, not just to drive the change, but what change has to happen and what is the path to make that change happen? I think it's kind of interesting. So um, cool. does that sound good? Next step? Sounds good. Works for right. me. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Appreciate, Appreciate the time. Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good night.